me. Hello. Hi, Welcome. friend. Welcome, everybody. Looks like we are live. So it's just you and me right now, Steph, but there's a whole bunch of other people here. So welcome everyone to Designing for Understanding. My name is Jeremy Osborne. I'm the Academic Director at Aquint Gymnasium, and I'm coming to you live from Boston, Massachusetts. If you're not familiar with Gymnasium, here's the quick version. We're located at thegymnasium.com. Once you get there, you'll find free online courses from world-class instructors on topics ranging from web design and development to user experience to content strategy and much, much more. Speaking of content strategy, today's chat features Stephanie Hay, who is not only the instructor for our course, Writing for Web and Mobile, but she's currently the head of content strategy at Capital One, and she is coming to you live from Washington, DC. It's true. Hello. All right. It's good that you're live, too, because that would be really <laughs> weird if it wasn't. So for the next hour, I'm going to have a chat with Stephanie on the topic of content-first design and how it can be used on your digital projects. And later on, we'll be joined by John Hodgins, who is based in Baltimore and is the Senior Communications Manager at the Annie E. Casey Foundation. A few years ago, John and Stephanie worked together on a redesign of their site, so he's going to jump in a little later. Uh, Beyonce, I don't think is going to show up, but there have been rumors. <laughs> I'm bummed. Yeah, no, seriously, I don't, I don't know who started that, but <laughs> John did. <laughs> oh, okay. So you know what to expect when he comes on. So uh, a few housekeeping notes before we truly start. In the last 15 minutes or so of this, Stephanie is going to be taking some questions for everybody. And to handle those questions, we have our behind the scenes superstar, Catherine Weber who handles the marketing here at uh, Equin Gymnasium. And you'll actually see Catherine in the chat window as Gymnasium Tweets. And when it comes time, she'll promote some questions from you, and then Stephanie can answer them. Um, if you haven't used Blab before, you can actually ask a question by typing the forward slash and then Q, and then your question. And you also have a chance to go live with us. So you can call in um, later on. We have, if you have a working webcam and a microphone, and if you're not wearing pajamas, um, I don't know. I just threw that in there. But should we let people wear pajamas? <laughs> yeah, I'm wearing sweatpants right now. So. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. So that's that's about as much as you're going to hear me talk today. Without further ado, as I mentioned before, Stephanie Hay leads the content strategy team at Capital One. In the past, she co-founded Fast Customer, and she designed content for UIE, Ben & Jerry's, and of course, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, which we'll hear some more about. Welcome, Stephanie. How are you doing this fine spring day? I am fabulous. Thank you, Jeremy. And thanks, everybody, 103 people who are here. Thanks for making time. Um, Excellent. And also... Uh, Jeremy, I just want to say this reminds me of where we were two years ago when we were working on this course together, uh, just like this, uh, back and forth doing recordings, and it, it brings a single tear to my eye. It does. We were like holed up in a in a room for like a week, um, doing all sorts of recording and and whatnot. <laughs> uh, I want to make sure that let's see, I, I'm getting some seeing some chat. Is everyone hearing audio? Hopefully, people can hear me. Yes, I can hear good, someone said. <laughs> Excellent. Thank <laughs> Excellent. you. Cool. Um, so, wow, we're going to talk about this um, content first stuff. What What is it? Why should? Why do we care? Um, where do we use it? All those good things. Maybe maybe that's a good place to start. Well, I, I'll tell you, I, I started practicing content first design out of uh, burnout, frankly. I was, at the time, um, several years ago, had just come out of working on a startup, uh, Fast Customer, where we found what the business model was, but it was actually a B2B business model, and we had all been very passionate about the B2C space, so why we started the company in the first place. And so it was sort of bittersweet because we decided to, to walk away from it. And, um, and so I was like laying around on the couch a bunch watching episodes of Downton Abbey and <laughs> and going over to this place called Top Golf, which is amazing. They have around they're like two level driving ranges with 
you know, computer chips or, or chips in um, the ball and you hit it and you've got a bay in the window or you've got a computer in the, the bay where you're anyway, I'm getting way out on this top golf thing, but top golf is amazing. And okay. um, it's a two level driving range. So that's pretty much all I was doing. And I started playing video games too. And I was playing this game called animal crossing and uh, it's for Nintendo 3DS. And I realized as I was playing this opening scene, when you've done nothing except start the game and a cute little character comes and sits across a train, sits in a seat on, on a train across from you and start asking you questions like, uh, you know, what's your name? And at that point you fill in your name and it says, you know, you know, do I have the time right? And where are you going? And then you fill in the name of the city where you're going that mm -hmm. it actually, it was a form. I mean, it was a form that was gathering information about me, the player, but it was doing it in such a conversational, creative way that it completely shifted the way I had been thinking about design prior to that. So um, I was in a place in my life, point being, I'd been in a place in my life where I had um, sort of been receptive, I think, to thinking about new things and mm -hmm. um, was ready to um, try new practices and seeing what video games we're doing to engage their players in this conversational and in a progressive disclosure kind of way made me think, why can't we do this for the websites we design or the products that we design instead of trying to get everybody to like, here are all the features or here are all the things that you know up front. And now that you know, now make a choice. It's just not natural conversational flow in the way you would do it in real life. Right. So I started working um, on another um, project. I started working with some startups and with my consulting clients at the time to pressure test this idea of let's just start in a Google doc. Let's just start right in the content. Let's use that as a level setting measure to figure out what the story is. And mm -hmm. once we have the story, then let's design something that really brings that story to life. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of cool. So it's like basically you, you know, this, there's this um, you know, little virtual friend, you're kind of having a conversation with them and that leads you to think about how you can have, conversations with people through, through a website or a mobile app. That, That's right. That, yeah. Um, so like this conversation part, so you just mentioned a Google doc. I mean, what, what, um, how does that start? Cause usually the, the websites I've worked on in the past is kind of like you, you know, you show up and the designers are there and the <laughs> UX people are there and, you know, everyone's there. Um, and they've all, all got some ideas about. That's right. Yeah. So, so yeah. That, so, so this is the typical process flows like that, right? You have everybody get in a room and they talk about what they want for the website or what they want for the product, their, their big vision for the thing. Mm -hmm. But the thing is just the mechanism through which you are trying to make a connection with someone on the other side. Mm -hmm. And this idea of content first ignores the thing for a minute, which is abnormal for human nature. You want to structure, you want to plan, you want to predict the future, you want to get everything down in writings to minimize risk. And every time that you, um, every time that you do that, you actually push yourself further away from the, the truth that you're trying to uncover in such a way that it actually connects with the person on the other side of the interface. That's that understanding piece. Mm -hmm. So um, the Google Doc is, is, um, it's just, it, does, it doesn't have to be a Google Doc. Any sort of shared um, collaborative space is just a place where you go, you know what, we're not going to get into wireframes. They're actually too high fidelity. We're not going to get into sketches. They're too high fidelity. It's starting to introduce this idea of layout or flow or channel. And we're not doing that yet. We're just trying to figure out what is the language we should be using to talk about whatever it is that we want to talk about. Or what is the language that our customers are using to, what is their mental model to, to understand this thing that we're trying to you know, sell them or show them or get them excited about. And the lowest fidelity way to do that is our words. Cool. So if we sit across a table from somebody and pitch to them exactly what we're, what we're get, getting ready to tell them on a website or through a product experience, and they go, oh, that sounds nice. You know, I can imagine right. somebody wanting that. You know, that's like a vanity metric. You don't want to go there. That's mediocre. You want the person who says, oh, do you mean like this? And then you realize that everything that they say after like this is the way that somebody understands what it is that you are trying to communicate. And man, what if you led with that? Right. And it, I mean, it seems really logical to me. And, and but, uh, but having been in this industry for a while, um, it's kind of, it's not, you know, it sounds 
pretty reasonable, right? That we should all sit around and, and agree on the content before we start <laughs> building stuff. But um, no, no. But yeah, but why? You know, I mean, I, I guess we could talk about why that's not the case. But but maybe it's just smarter to kind of focus on, um, you know, how that really works. So do you do you sit down and mm-hmm. and what do you say? Like, yeah, we've, we've got some ideas, or, or or is there more structure, or what does that look like? I mean, this is not. This is not new, right? Hollywood did this. Mm-hmm. Shakespeare did this. Right. <laughs> the yeah. video game industry has done this. They have narrative yeah. writers and they have um, they have story designers whose job it is to sit down before there is the fidelity to it, before there is the entire character persona attached to it, and to uncover what the story is and what the language is that's going to form the overall tone of whatever mm-hmm. it is that the team is trying to create. So the way that this looks like, you know, the way that this breaks down um, often is uh, there's no process here. It's it's a mindset. It's a willingness to jump in and start, you know, look at a, a blank document or, or um, mm-hmm. if you're sitting across from someone, having done the work to prompt them to talk mm-hmm. about um, what it is that they, the values that they have or the needs that they have that they, that we could potentially solve rather than the thing we want them to actually um provide feedback on. So I'll give you an example. Um, Mm -hmm. We get together with um, teams creating a a new product or a new feature and we sit down and they say, look, we've created all these flows, we've created all these screens, can we go through the content? This is typical, right? Or in a website redesign, hey, we've already got this architecture, we wanna architect the content first and then we'll plug in the real content later. So automatically, this is what you're used to. This is the typical way of doing it. Mm-hmm. Everything I'm talking about, though, is reverse engineering what is typical. It is saying we're actually going to front load the hardest part of this work, which is making the connection with the person. Yep. And we're going to uncover that. And we're going to focus on that. We're going to figure out what language they use and what language we should use to achieve understanding together. And then we're actually going to figure out the best way to bring that to life. Mm-hmm. And not everyone has that mindset or that willingness to work in that way because, you know, to your original question, like, why is that? it feels better to try and predict the future to minimize the risk. It feels better to outline the creative um, manifestation of whatever it is that we're working on more than it, you know, that feels better. That feels more controllable than anything else. So that's why people do it. Yeah. And it reminds Um, me a little bit of, of, I mean, you were mentioning the, the, you know, the Hollywood, the movie connection. I mean, I I think there's kind of a, famous story now with you know like pixar right pixar goes through this process of you know this low fidelity uh you know animated movie before they start that's right before they stick all their 3d animators on it and they get this <laughs> and they get the story right right so they have this this mini movie that's completely done before they even begin you know rendering that that first character and and this feels to me like a little bit like the same but it's but it's but it also feels very different on the web. It's and again, it's it's um, mm-hmm. you know we didn't start with stories. Maybe I don't know. You know, but um, this is, it's the mindset of to say like, what is it that you're trying to achieve in mm-hmm. the connection with the user or the customer? Mm-hmm. If that's the starting point of the conversation, rather, what are your hopes and dreams for this thing, or what is this thing supposed to do? Which we always get caught up in, and that stuff's important to understand somebody's vision, but. You start with the outcome first, the ideal outcome first, and then try to work backward from there. We're actually aligned around a common vision just like that. Right. So Journey actually is another video game I, I cite regularly. This is, um, this is a game that the, the creators of this game ended up taking much longer by more than a year to release the product than they had originally scoped. And the reason was fundamental to their philosophy of creating the game in the first place, which is that they started with this ideal outcome that the players would be emotionally moved when they completed the game. Mm -hmm. And so they kept iterating on the story and iterating on the story and the interactions of the characters um, and then putting that that beta game in front of players until over the course of these three years that they were working on it, they finally got, got it to a place where the players, most of the players cried when they finished playing the game. Huh. And then they said, okay, great. Now we've made that connection. Now we, a player understands our intention and we understand that they have actually uh, felt that outcome. 
Right. At which point they released the game and it became this, this knockout uh, sort of indie for Sony game uh, journey, which I recommend everybody play. And I totally bawled when I played it too afterward. Um, so, so I'm it's be, working uh, outcome first. So I'm going to date myself here because when you say journey, the video game, I, I'm reminded of the uh, 1980s power uh, band journey. <laughs> we actually had a terrible, a terrible video game. And I'm glad to hear this has nothing to do Did with they it. Really? No, no. <laughs> uh, a little uh, parody rocking out so um this is not that so but, but, sesame but street did this too sesame street, sesame street did this too their <laughs> outcome was to teach students their outcome was not tv programming right. it was we are going to use tv as the catalyst the mechanism through which we are going to teach kids who are having a hard time keeping up with their their more affluent suburban counterparts and they mm -hmm. said we'll know we're winning when the kids are learning. So how are they gonna measure learning? Well, if you look up this, you can find this on YouTube, old uh, video of, of a very young James Earl Jones reading the alphabet. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he pauses three seconds in between each letter. And the reason is because the show's creators brought together this cross-functional group of folks, you know, practitioners from child psychology through television programming, et cetera, uh, they found that if they waited two seconds, the, the students would lose interest and if they waited four seconds and or wouldn't learn. And if they waited four seconds, the students would learn interest. But three seconds, the, right. the students would actually start yelling out the next letter in the alphabet, which was learning. So, right. right. So they found the sweet spot and they kind of found like that, that perfect timing. That's right. Well, that's, they had to focus on the content and the outcome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so this sounds pretty reasonable. It's like, okay, this is logical. It makes tons of sense to me that we start with the content first. Um, you walk into that room and there's like all those people <laughs> and they're all invested. And, you know, there's got to be, I mean, what, what sort of structure is there? How do we, I mean, it is, you know, what, what do you do? Do you, do you, um, you mean, because you got to kind of win them over, right? Or not. I mean, what, <laughs> <laughs> I normally play Beyonce actually and just walk oh, in and like snap a few times and you write that down. Beyonce. Um, that's yeah. right. Um, what, what I normally start with are some, are questions again, that are, that anybody could answer and they're going to answer differently depending upon who they are and where they are in the organization. Mm -hmm. So what are the top questions that your stakeholders or customers ask? Mm -hmm. And what are the top complaints that your stakeholders or customers ask? Okay. Here's what's great about that question. If I'm sort of patting myself on the back by saying that, I'm sorry about that. But what I'm trying to say about this question is, it's not about the thing you're trying to create. It's about whether or not you're already making the connection, um, whether or not you're already achieving understanding with the customers on the other side of the interface. So mm -hmm. if they come back and, you know, if, if the, the person who leads marketing versus IT, they're gonna have different answers, but those answers are gonna yield potential starting points that we could dig into to start crafting something around that, right? So um, in the case of Ben and Jerry, when we were working with them, Ben and Jerry's um, asking that question, they said that it was the um, people were calling to find flavors. And another thing they were calling about is to figure out where, what happened to the flavors, you know? And mm. said, well, how are you answering these questions right now? And they said, well, you know what? We're actually not, you know, we have this thing internally called the flavor graveyard, but um, I guess we should probably <laughs> make that more prevalent, right? Yeah. Because here's the thing, when you make when you achieve that understanding, you know that there's that outcome, it actually manifests itself in the business in some way. For startups, they're gonna gain traction. For mm -hmm. something like Ben and Jerry's, it's gonna cut down on call volume or inbound email volume of people looking for something that we just by asking that question, we uncovered we just needed to answer in a different way. That's cool. So so if I'm getting you correctly, you're basically kind of again, there's this concept of reverse engineering. So starting starting with the things that the customers are saying about you or your company or your website, and then kind of turning that around and, and using it. It's, it's kind of like, a, it's almost like a judo. It's like some sort of form of <laughs> judo. It's like, take, take the stuff that's happening, right? Take the stuff that's organically being created and, and use it. Again, it sounds really logical. It's like, you know, and, and at the same time, again, people in this industry know that it's, um, that it's very difficult to do that, right? Or it's very, you know, everyone says that they want to do that, right? And then That's right. We, we get all these other layers and we get user experience that comes in later on and kind of tests the fact that maybe, you know, we're doing this 
right? Do we need these sort of buttons? But but you're just saying, you know what? Like let's let's start with words. Let's start right. with, with words, and like and that becomes the skeleton. I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up too because I, I that's a we commonly conflate usability and understandability. Mm -hmm. And one is about fidelity and one is about connection. And they, they overlap, they're definitely related. Mm -hmm. But by front loading the understandability piece, you've just made all of your marketing and your sales and your operations better, easier, right. uh, healthier. Right. Um, right. If, you, if you think all we have to do is make this usable and functional and minimum viable product becomes like, what can we get out the door versus minimum desirable product, which is what people actually understand and use, Mm -hmm. And you're putting a ton of pressure on having to market something that might actually not be the right thing, any, or sell something that might not be the right thing. Same thing with architecting an entire taxonomy or information architecture, entire website, without starting with what is the most sought after content? What are the top questions and complaints that, that okay. your, your customers are using or providing? You're ending up creating something around that's much more cre about a creative process of development than it mm -hmm. is about achieving a connection with someone. Mm -hmm. And for lots of people, the former is really enjoyable. And, and for lots of people, it's maddening. If you've got real metrics that you have to deliver for your organization, you want to be able to say, this made a difference, which mm -hmm. is much harder to do if Everyone is focused on creating something that is right. usable right. primarily and getting it out to market quickly in hopes that people understand it. Right. It's just, the, it's just backwards. Right. And, this, and, and there's also the, the addition of the snowball effect, right? It's like once you, once you go down that path and, and you start building stuff and people start, you know, digging into their different roles, it's kind of like if you're going in the wrong direction, then you're going to end up wasting a lot of time and it. energy. And and so again, it's like the, I mean, th this in a way, this this takes this is like the first step or or a prior step to prototyping, right? In a way, in prototyping right. is all about you know start fast, fail often, you know create That's these right. things that we can we can quickly test to make sure that they work. And again, the, what what you know, my opinion, what, why this stuff is so great is that this this takes it even one step further back. It says you know. We can't prototype anything until we understand what we're talking about and um, what people want to do. <laughs> That's right. The low uh, it, understanding here is those two sides, right? It's the lowest risk content first design, whether you were just talking about your idea and looking for feedback mm -hmm. from the person you're talking to that feels much more like a conversion and less like an opinion. Mm -hmm. Things like how do I how do I sign up or where do I give you my money? You know, those are good signs. If you start with that, that's the lowest risk, lowest cost way to validate direction, mm -hmm. which then changes the internal team dynamics as much as it ends up influencing the external product that you launch. Mm -hmm. So this all sounds really good in theory. <laughs> so I wonder if there's anyone we might have who um, could tell us a little about this in practice. And oh, that's right, we have John. We have John Hodgins from the Annie E. Casey Foundation, who I mentioned is going to jump on board. And so, um, you know, you had a chance to work with with John and kind of bring this um, kind of theory into practice. So hopefully mm -hmm. we can um, have him on board. Welcome, John. So, Hello. There. Hello, John. Welcome. Thank you once again for taking part in this. This is very generous. Uh, you and your time and so I'll, I'll kind of let you two run with a little bit but I will kind of just you know so it might help um, just to talk a little bit about the um, the generic constraints of the project that you're doing so so the Annie uh, Casey Foundation was essentially redesigning their website a few years ago correct yeah. and uh, we were looking to kind of um, shift the site from uh, what it had been doing to do something that was going to address more of what we wanted strategically as an organization and what we felt that our stakeholders were looking for from us. We wanted mm -hmm. to start a new conversation with them. So we brought in uh, Steph and her team. So she comes in and she has this wild, crazy idea about starting with uh, <laughs> Google, a Google Doc. Um, 
And how did that work out? So first, we didn't know it was a crazy idea. We just thought we right. were, <laughs> you know, it was it was introduced very um, subtly, like you know, let's start like an FAQ document, and you know, through that we looked at um, some of our analytics to see what people were using on the site, and we looked at the incoming email that was generated by the website so that we could figure out what questions our audience was using. And that kind of started the um, Google Doc. We were just answering those questions and we were iterating it um, you know, week after week. And you know, we'd, we'd answer a question and then that would lead us to, well, what's the next thing that we would provide? And so then we would start building out the content for that page. And we um, would then go to the next page from there or what elements needed to be on a page. And so, uh, it wasn't really until we were a couple months into it that we realized we were building the website um, uh, mm -hmm. and that the wireframes and everything else were going to come from this uh, real world content that we were building. And it was content that we were getting approved by uh, senior leaders. So it was, you know, um, validated upfront that we, we were moving in a good direction. And uh, it was a, it was a great process. So in addition to being this content first judo. Uh, she was also, Steph was also like this content first ninja. She like slipped in. She was like, hey, we're going to start with some customer data. And, and that sounds really logical. And then next thing you know, you're building a website. Is that pretty much how it goes, right? And we're actually seeing a picture of the, um, of the skeleton of that um, uh, Google Doc right there in the, on the screen. So... Yeah, so, you know uh, what? What, yeah. what this was about, and, and to your original question too about how does this work, is you yeah. don't sell it; you just do it. Yeah, it's actually doing work, and people are willing to do work if you set up meetings and you sit down and you ask them great questions that they can answer. Um, right now, and you don't need to ask them if they're willing to do work; you just do it by asking the questions and getting in that raw that that raw and regular work cycle and that's what that google doc was it wasn't like a plan like we are going to do a google doc and it's going to go xyz it was like let's just start working together and here are our notes this is the most important content now that we've nailed this and all the people who who uh you know are potentially otherwise going to be involved later in the process and not approving it because we didn't involve them early enough have already improved it how does somebody get here and where do they go next and then we work on the mm -hmm. content for the page of how they get here. And we work on the content for where they go next. And we just keep doing that process over and over again, which ultimately organically is what created that information architecture that you see in that workbook. Mm -hmm. It didn't start with the homepage. It didn't start with the most sought after, right. you know, <laughs> highly territorial page. It started with the most important content for the, the member who was coming to the AKC Foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you talk about that a little bit more? Because I, I, that to me, that this is this is one of the, the the fascinating and and awesome pieces of that. So again, like for for those in those in the audience who are kind of used to this world, it's like the the, the home page typically becomes this um, strange battleground where different um, departments are kind of fighting for you know for their say, and you know people want to be on the top, and you know get it gets very weird very quickly i think people have found but so so there's again it kind of totally dodged that by starting somewhere else right it wasn't it wasn't the home page it wasn't like the about us like what what was it that you actually were doing the the um the, some of the the terms and services agreement am i remembering that correctly no, not no. for AEC. yeah go yeah, ahead Jim. No. Okay. yeah for us it was starting with you know First, those frequently asked questions, you know, what are the um, 10 things that when people come came to the current website, what information weren't they getting and what, and, you know, and ultimately what did they want? And so we started, you know, kind of answering those questions and building out more information uh, based on that. Um, and then from there, we knew that people came to our website to download the reports that we produce. Um, uh, and so we then spent a lot of time kind of figuring out that page and, you know, we're a um, we're kind of a stuffy, boring organization, and we have spent, you know, a lot of time and money writing these, like, you know, sixty-page PDFs that nobody would really want to read on the web. So finding new ways to kind of lift up that content onto report pages um, to help people discover the content and then make the investment to download the report. 
So it was, mm -hmm. um, it was an interesting process. Um, you know, I think the content first, um, you know, not only were we doing the work, but we were doing two other really important things. First, by starting with the user, we um, sidestepped the whole organizational chart that our internal people desperately wanted the website to be. And uh, right, right. so that, um, so when we presented them a huge amount of content that did not reflect what they called themselves or what they thought that they did, um, but they saw that happen across all of the programs, um, it, it gave us a buy-in to try things differently. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is that we were working with a, a pretty large content team of stakeholders for, for, throughout the organization. And each week we would get on these calls and they were painfully iterative at first. I mean, we worked on that first report page, I think for six weeks. And, <laughs> um, and, and just training ourselves to write differently and to think differently. And so when we were then starting to write the About Us page, it was like 10 seconds of copy because mm -hmm. we had trained our team and empowered so many people across the organization to write and work in a different way. And so the organizational gains beyond a great website were, um, you know, are helping to sustain the content strategy years later. And, and the other part of that to me, this, that is great is because again, this, you know, so, so, okay. So we've got like the buy-in, um, you know, we're, we're, we're folding in the customer information. We have the organization, um, like the, the, the people making, the final call kind of they're on board but there's more than that too right there's like a whole other team and and um you know there's designers and developers and there's people who are actually building the site and they kind of it, it's almost like it's, this is truly the beginning of of a team project um yep. i'm kind of wondering stephanie if you can talk a little bit about that like how this how this leads to like truly being like a team effort versus these little silos of, of yeah. um, information departments. One of the most joyful parts of uh, my job, the 15 folks on, on my team um, now at Capital One on the content strategy team, um, we, have, we have this thing called content champs, which are, we actually give trophies to people. It says, heck yeah, you are a content champ. Um, and mm -hmm. the main way that you get this is by actually breaking out of your own self um uh sort of i don't know your your own self judgment about what about your ability to write yeah so right. this idea of content first design does not take a con a, you know a copywriter doesn't take a content mm -hmm. strategist um somebody with a journalism background it takes someone who is willing to break outside of uh, of the comfort zone mm -hmm. that that is, that's established by our, our traditional design process of like let someone else figure it out later Let's just write headline goes here or norm yeah. ipsum um, and say, no, 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 I'm going to take a stab at this right here. Because this, not only by me taking a stab at it, do I actually insert my own intent? You know, I give you the context of what I think should go here, but I'm starting mm -hmm. to practice. Um, a, I, I'm starting to practice a different kind of design, one in which we actually embrace content as part of the experience rather mm -hmm. than as a piece of real estate within yeah. all of the other stuff that we have created that we're really proud of. Right. And that mindset shift empowers anybody to become uh, a writer or content strategist. And that's what we want, is for you to not think that this is a specialized thing, but, uh, but rather that this is an, a responsibility you have to right. the success of, of yourself, to the project, to all the people around you, to um, understand what language your customers are using and mm -hmm. to take a stab at trying to speak to them in a natural way. So yeah, designers, I mean, product managers, it doesn't, you know, the, the marketing person, the IT person, like it doesn't matter. If you're willing yeah. to take a stab at it, do it. And, and I can imagine it feels really liberating. Again, I mean, the projects I've worked with, it's, it's you know, people don't really like being put in in the boxes, right? Like if you're the developer, um, you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't have some input necessarily on, you know, what this interaction is or what it looks like or maybe ways to to improve it. Um, and it just feels like this is, again, a, a way to lay that foundation. So, you know, we're, we're all doing the same thing here. We're moving towards the same goal. That's um, right. And, you know, and so speaking like that goal too, John, I'm kind of curious to, so, you know, we talked a lot about, a lot about the process of doing this. And it sounds mm -hmm. like, again, the process was really logical. Um, 
you got people on board, it, it, it felt good, you, you got the results you were looking for, or, or, or did you? I mean, what, what, can you talk a little bit about like what the, the, um, the end game and how, you know, it's been over two years, I believe, mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, so how, how's, the, how's everything worked out? Uh, you know, I think, it, I think it's, um, it's been very successful. You know, I think we're, we're seeing um, better search results, uh, you know, traffic coming to the site. We are seeing increases in page views. We're, we did see a decline in certain types of incoming email asking us questions, which, you know, freed up some resources to do that. Um, so it's been very good. But I think that, you know, we continue to try and um, iterate. And it, kind of the process, like, never ends. Sure, sure. And which is, is really is exciting is that through the original process, it was so intensive, we now have all these resources within our organization who can right. um, recognize when there's an area for improvement and they can take a stab at it themselves. And yeah. um, uh, so it, it's, it's, it's been pretty, it's been pretty impressive. And, and some of our initial assumptions, you know, some of them didn't pay off, like in terms of like, we sure. thought we'd get more traffic in certain areas. And, uh, but, uh, but then we're finding strengths in other areas and then we're use, able to use what we've learned to um, strengthen those even more and then make changes to improve what didn't. I think that that's a really valuable point, probably one worth emphasizing, because again, we all know, or we should know, that the, you know once you publish a redesigned site, right, that that's just the beginning, that there's an awful lot of work that goes into the initial process. But, you know, the the dirty little secret of the web sometimes is people like publish sites and then they walk off and it's like, hey, we're done. The truth is, no, you really, you know, it's, it's got to be evolving. You have to adjust with analytics and all that. And so again, it sounds to me like this is this common language. So when it comes time, if, if something isn't maybe working the way you thought it would, you, you don't, you're not lost. You're not in the woods. You, you, you have something to fall back on, you know, the, the content workbook and this Google doc and, mm -hmm. and all that. That's right. That's kind of important to, uh, to mention. Um, One thing too that you sure. mentioned earlier about like terms and conditions, I do want to say is um, another way to get people working on this is aside from not picking the most highly sought after organizational territorial thing, like the homepage is to think mm -hmm. about the micro moments that people are mm -hmm. often responsible for. Like if legal is responsible for terms and conditions, invite mm -hmm. them to co-write it together. Say, hey, we want to take the first paragraph of the terms and conditions here and see if we can make it more natural language. Because not that we expect everybody to sit down and read terms and conditions, but for the small percentage of people who will, it they'll get a signal from us that not everyone gets, right? Not every company will sit and invest in trying to take things that are otherwise just the default stuff right. and actually make it understandable. Uh, error messages are another huge one. Like developers get a terrible rep for like, oh, this person didn't write a good error message. But like that person was trying to get something out the door. It was probably under a deadline. Nobody gave that person the content and they were doing the best that they could. But maybe if we sat down and actually created it or even created it up at the front of the, the process, that, um, that we would actually be empowering people to consider these otherwise totally, you know, benign moments as areas to be very delightful and we can practice uh, writing the content together yeah. that you know that continues like John was saying like that starts this um, pattern where like we we're doing we did this at Capital One uh, we have a, a an app out called credit wise any customer or anyone can actually download you don't have to be a customer to use it and the terms and conditions in, in credit wise came through a collaboration with our legal team um, mm -hmm. who are like so awesome. And, right. um, but because of the typical processes are typically at the end, you know, ex sure. shown something and expected to approve it. And then they get a bad rep for, you know, yeah. saying, well, look, you didn't think about these things, but that's cool. Right. So involving them in the process really is this, um, it just builds momentum and scales this practice. It sounds like this is the common theme. It's kind of like you have this, there's this communication that, that this, this technique facilitates. It's, it's, um, and, and it's a communication based on like this, like you're saying, the simplest thing, the piece that we can all do, which is, um, you know, write, write down some words and mm -hmm. again, it all, and it all counts, right? So these micro interactions could be, you know, um, you know, the click of a button or and just anything. And, right. um, these are all as important, if not more important, than 
whatever shows up on the top of the, the homepage. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So I think we're going to try to flip or switch gears here and um, go for some some questions. So I'm seeing some stuff in the chat here. Um, I'll just kind of scroll back a little bit. Um, so Leo Grafico talks about how, how did you select and recruit users? Did you define user profiles prior and selected a certain number from each group? Um, so I'm assuming that refers to the customers, maybe? I'm not sure exactly. Um, so, so we can start with that. I mean, again, who, who, how, how do you, let's just start with this. You know, where do we get that, cons uh, that customer data? Are we assuming that the company is gathering it or is it just a conversation? What is, what is that like? Do you want to talk about the data that we looked at with AECF, John? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so there were a couple things. First, there were the users that we did have to, uh, to our site. And so, we knew from what was being downloaded um, and we did some user surveys. I think we installed like a pop-up window that if you came to the site, you were asked if you wanted to participate in an interview um, with some of our designers. Um, and so we were able to build a persona of the people that were coming to our site. And they are what um, are, are social workers or practitioners, people that work directly with kids and families, which is what the Casey Foundation is about. And But we also knew that strategically, we wanted to reach out to um, policymakers, people that could help make a uh, large change on a systems mm -hmm. level. And so we then um, sought out people that we would want to be the audience of the website and interviewed them and then created personas around um, each individual so that we were uh, making sure that we were meeting the need of our existing customers, but also um, uh, positioning our content in a way that it would be easier for our intended audience to, mm -hmm. to get. So that kind of yeah. sounds like again, there's there's this blend of of uh, analytics, right? So just just the raw data where you don't know any anyone behind the clicks, right? They're just anonymous folks. But then there's like the, the polar opposite. There's the humans, right? The people who are actually uh, you know who, who you want to empathize with and you want to you know a, a put a name and a face to, and and it's it's like the synthesis of of those two things, which sounds to me pretty pretty reasonable. Um, there, um, we, also, to, in answering that question about um, where do we get users, how do we how do we do any sort of testing or um, gather that data? I, when we're working on fast customer, these are people in the coffee shop who are willing to talk to us, and we get in there, and the very first time we have a conversation for five or ten minutes, it's tough because we're learning what kind of conversation we should be having with them as much as they're actually giving us information. And um, when you get into an organization the size of, of Capital One, you have so much data at your disposal from call center transcripts to, you know, email feedback to the interactions um, through um, web or mobile properties. Um, we, you know, at that point, it just becomes a, a matter of, of trying to make sense of the data and trying to find the themes within it um, from a quantitative perspective. But we also um, sit down and do empathy interviews with people and say, you know, what are the things that... Um, what are the things that you're struggling with? What are the things that would make your life easier? Um, and then we continue to hone in on it to really understand what is going to be meaningful to this person based on who this person is. So it ends up being this, you know, back and forth scenario of um, trying to balance the qualitative and the quantitative content together or the data mm -hmm. together. So it looks that it looks like there's these two questions that they're kind of um, basically of the same vein. From Jim Webb, who nah, I don't know this guy I've heard of. Jim Webb. And, yes. and, um, and someone else, but basically there's a, I'll, I'll just use Jim's, but it looks like Kwong Tron had the same uh, question. Basically, lots of folks are used to writing like a press release or in language that's complex or academic. Do you have a rule of thumb that helps folks write simply? Yeah, great question, Jim Webb. Uh, uh, creator of other curriculum and uh, gymnasium. Anyway, um, so there is a, a, a trick we use on a regular basis, which is uh, start a sentence with now you can and then complete the sentence and then go back and remove the words now you can. 
This Whoa. is one way to get people to stop trying to like make promises and follow the traditional marketing language of like, you ever, you know, it feels like an infomercial a little bit. Like, you, does this ever happen to you? You know, are you this kind of person? If so, we've got what you need. Uh, mm -hmm. Just say it, just get in there. Now you can, um, uh, you know, pay bills with your phone, whatever it is. And then take, take out now you can, and it's just pay bills with your phone. Take, take this approach over and over again to keep focusing on the meat. Another, another uh, we have three pillars of our content strategy at Capital One. It's, it's um, use case specific. It's actually got to serve a purpose, natural language, and we would have qualitative and quantitative data to support that. And also contextually relevant, meaning this is the right place to say this. And this is the hardest part for natural language to boil it down is to say, you know, what is, if you imagine like a video game continues, you keep leveling up the more that you gain skill, that's how a conversation unfolds too. That's mm -hmm. the hardest part of creating great content is being willing to edit yourself out, edit out all of the things that you know to make sure that the conversation continues to get more complex as somebody reads along. Rather than trying to give them 16 different options up front to figure out where they want to go before you've given them the necessary substance to be able to make that choice comfortably anyway. So that, you know, those three pillars are, are the ways that we help people make decisions about content and contextual relevance is really the hardest, which is, is this the right context to say this? Is this the most relevant spot to say this? Mm -hmm. If the answer is no, it goes. Right. I, I love that idea of leveling up because again, it's, you know, these, these are fun approaches or at least or different angles that we can, we can use to look at you know, subjects that, again, maybe don't remind us of gaming or Hollywood movies or whatever, but there's no reason why you can't use some of the same strategies to to make your content accessible and enjoy, enjoyable and, you know, and, and give people a, um, you know, a, a nice user experience. Um, so the, on that topic too, we've got another question about, um, which kind of drifts into the user experience realm. But it's basically, I know this is content first approach, but were focus groups included in trying to make the process better? Um, so it sounds like perhaps, so, so after the fact, perhaps for the people, I mean, I, I assume that's kind every, of traditional usability, but. Every process is, well, focus groups about the, okay, so I think there might be two ways to answer this question. Sure. Focus groups about the content first process itself. No such thing. The content first process is a working process and every single process is a focus group in and of itself. You can continue mm -hmm. coming back to it like after a couple weeks and say, hey, are we working together in a collaborative way? And even as John said, when they first got started, it was like when I was prodding them to keep writing and we would do some like homework and I would come back the next week that it was a little tough early on. And then once they got it, they ramped. And that's actually typical. Most of the time, people are so used to seeing a creative brief or trying again to maintain uh, some control over the future that they have tried to script out exactly how things will fall, that they're not comfortable working in the language. They're not comfortable in trying to understand the story together or create the story together. But 30 minutes a week, sit down, you get into a Google Doc together, you pick up where you left off or two hours a week or 30 minutes a day or whatever it is for the particular team you're working in they will naturally start to become, uh, start to form exactly the kind of process that is going to be progressive for that particular team dynamic and mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and then focus groups for, you know, content first, you know, process that we have created in a content first methodology are uh, sort of the same user groups, qualitative and quantitative. The difference is we will start with a script, piece of paper in front of people with language on it. And we say, hey, how does this, you know, does this make sense to you? And if they say no, we say, okay, well, what's, what's some of the language that you would use differently? How would you say this instead? What's tripping you up about this? And then they give us their feedback and then we go, go away and we iterate on it really quick. And then we come back and we say, how does this feel to you? And they go, oh, that's great. I would totally buy that. Now we know we're on the right track. And if we can get the next person in our interviews to say that, and the next person, and the next person, then we're ready to go. Mm hmm Very cool. So this may be the last question, but we might have room for another one. Or if anyone wants to try to jump on, we can do that too. But we've got another question uh, from Leo Grafico. 
which is actually, yeah, this is a good question. How do you, how did you leverage the needs and language for users of different age and demographics? Oh, so I love this question. Thank yeah. you. Um, so this is, again, if you've ever read Choose Your Own Adventure books, like I did growing up, or you've played video games, uh, what the designers have created or what the writers have created are choices along the way that once you make that selection, then you're, you see a result that feels like that was connected to this, the choice that you made up front. We have an opportunity and a responsibility in tech, in, in FinTech and anywhere, to create systems that will enable us to design different uh, experiences in different layers with different language as part of that interface, depending upon who you are, which if we have you know, tech savvy enough and we've, we've created those systems to be nuanced enough, would mean that we would get better and better over time at personalizing the content to feel like a real conversation between two people or getting to know each other better over time. Mm -hmm. and this has been traditionally tough because we're, we're still brand new industry really. Um, and so, so we're, still, we're still dealing with scale and what happens is things get more generic as you scale, but there are way too many um, examples of really great niche um, nuanced products and services out there that are disrupting that uh, model. Mm -hmm. And now we have to think about how do we how do we get systems of scale that will allow us these levels of um, nuance in the experiences that we're designing to be able to uh, talk about money differently to a um, to somebody who's sixty five versus somebody who's fifteen. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to do that for sure, and um, and that's really one of the most powerful. Um, well, that's one of the best opportunities that we, we have from a content first design approach is because we can actually create those stories right now while we're developing the systems to be able to deploy and support them. And there's also kind of this comment, and again, we've, um, you know, we've been talking an awful lot about this, uh, you know, the, the context of redesigning the Annie EKC Foundation's website, but, you know, there's there's also just mobile, right? I mean, again, it's kind of like, do, do we differentiate? Are the, sto are, are the stories the same? Does it matter what kind of device you're using? Do we care that someone is on a phone versus their laptop? Or, you know, how? Do, I mean, at what point does that come in? It's the contextual relevance piece. From a content mm -hmm. strategy perspective, what what is your behavior? Who are you on on the on a phone versus a desktop? But um, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, what do I need to achieve? What is the understanding I need to have about your your usage of that or of uh, Amazon Echo or whatever? Mm -hmm. um, what is it that I need to understand about you and who you are and why you're mm -hmm. using this and how it interacts with me? What is that conversation that we should actually be having through this device? That's mm -hmm. why that contextual relevance piece of the content strategy that, that we practice is so crucial. Mm -hmm. That sounds to me like a killer ending to this. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna officially wrap this up. I want to uh, thank everyone who showed up. I want to thank everyone except Beyonce who did not show up. There's that open, there's that open seat in the middle. right hand corner. I'm sure she's pretty busy. She's got a lot of things going on. Um, she's looking for that. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm blaming you, John, for starting that, which. I know. Yeah. I'll take that. So, um, yeah, thank you for everyone who's here. Yeah, and and um, I hope it was useful for folks. Um, and a recording of this chat will be made available in a day or two, and you'll be able to access it in a couple different ways. Um, you can always follow Gymnasium Tweets on Twitter, and the link will be made there available shortly in the next day or so. Uh, you can also sign up for Stephanie's class, Writing for Web and Mobile at thegymnasium.com. And it's gonna take about a minute to do. And once you've enrolled there, we'll make the um, link very obvious on the class form so you can't miss it. And also this URL, so the same URL that you're using now to access this will have a copy of the recording. Again, I'm not sure how quickly that shows up, if it's immediate or if it's in a day or so. But that is, the place. Uh, okay, Kuhn, I got your name now. So next time I see you, <laughs> I'll remember to pronounce it correctly. Good. Um, anyway, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, John. Thank you, Steph. This was very cool. And uh, thank, thank you, you Catherine, behind the scenes for, for making this all happen. 
And we should do this again sometime. Let's do it. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Have a great day. Bye-bye.